the book of Galatians is all about the gospel, what it is and what it isn't. Once you understand those gospel things, you'll make smarter moves. It changes the game. It does change the game. And we're right in the middle of a series uh, called Game Changer. And today, we come to the book of Galatians, chapter number three. And I am so excited about this particular chapter because this particular chapter is all about the grace of God. And I'm just going to tell you right up front, I don't care who you are, how much background you have, nobody can ever possibly know enough about the grace of God. You don't know enough about the grace of God. Neither do I. The grace of God is something that we grow in, that we understand, that in eternity we'll understand even more. But the truth is this, great, this thing called the grace of God is so penetrating and so powerful and so life-changing. It is a game changer. So if you brought your Bibles, I'm going to be in, uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, and it'll be on the screen. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can, you can follow along in your Bible or on a mobile device, whatever your choice is. But here we go, Galatians chapter 3, verse number 1. This is what it says. Oh, foolish Galatians. Stop there for a second. <laughs> let's, just de- let's just deal with that first sentence in this chapter. Oh, foolish Galatians. Paul had, had established a, an incredible ministry in the region of Galatia. There are multiple churches. And these people were grounded and founded in the grace and truth of what Jesus Christ had come to do. And yet... In just a few short years, they had moved away from the true grace of Christ, and they began to live in a works-oriented concept. Now, my, my question to you is, if it could happen to them, how much more could it happen to us if we're separated a couple thousand years from the event of Jesus Christ or the events of Jesus Christ? So he says, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? This is a pretty powerful thing. This is a pretty pretty important concept. For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear as to you as if you had had seen a picture of his death on the cross. It was crystal clear, made it crystal clear about the work that Jesus Christ did on your behalf. Let me ask you this one question, he says. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you had heard about Christ. And here's where I'm going to camp today. This is where we're going to spend most of our morning. How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Why are you trying to make works the basis of your redemption and even sanctification before God? So let's stop and pray because we need the Spirit of God to teach us and move in our hearts. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for today. And I just pray that you would take the words that I just read out of your Bible and that you would make them come alive to us. And that, God, that you would allow us to see in our own hearts, Lord, how easy it is for us to drift away from the truths of Christ. And I I pray, God, that you would make this real and applicable in 21st century America, that your word would come alive to us, and that, God, my words would be used to stimulate your people to really understand a a journey to begin with the grace of Christ in their life. And I pray these things in Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name. Amen. So grace, this thing, this concept of grace, the grace of God, in its simplest definition would be described as God's unmerited favor. But what I want to describe to you is far deeper than that. And I'm just going to say, you could study the Bible, you could know God for 60, 70, 80 years in this life and still not know all the dimensions of the grace of God as it works out in your life. The grace of God is amazing. It's, it is God's change agent for you. It is how God transforms a life. He transforms it by His grace. And so this is a very important concept. And so grace is something we believe intellectually, but live as if it is not true. Let me say that to you one more time. If you want to tweet that, that'd be an awesome statement. But here's, here's what I want you to say. I want you to listen to this again. Grace is something we believe intellectually, but live as if it is not true. I'm going to unpack that as we work through our time together today. So the million dollar question is, do you believe, do you behave 
like you believe? Do, does, your, does your behavior reflect the grace of Jesus inside of your life? That is the process that the Bible calls sanctification is when my belief systems and my behaviors catch up to each other and I begin to behave in a proper way. And that my, the goal of Jesus in my life is for me to be like him. And the same is true in your life. So the million dollar question is, is does your behavior reflect what you actually believe? Can people look at your behavior and say, ah, there is a Christ follower. There is a person, a man or woman who is filled with God's grace. Grace is something we hope is true. <laughs> I love this statement. Grace is something that we hope is true for ourselves, but hope it is not true for our enemies, right? <laughs> Come on now. We want God to just kind of get his zapper out, you know, his, like his, his mosquito zapper. And for my enemies, you know, just they get too close and wow, zap, they're gone. I mean, you know, honestly, we may not say that out loud. Only Pastor Dan has the ability to say that out loud. He's the only foolish one around. around. But the truth is, is oftentimes we hope the grace of God is true in our own life. But we don't really care about the people outside, especially those who are our enemies. That is another example of how our belief systems don't match, match up to our behaviors. So what I want to do with you for just a few minutes is I want to deepen your understanding of the grace of God in your life. And so I want to do that by bringing out five concepts that really further def define what grace is all about based upon Scripture, based upon insight from God's Word. So here they are. First of all, grace is undeserved. Let's start there. Say the word undeserved with me. Undeserved. The first thing that I need to understand is that all I receive from God is based upon the fact that I do not deserve it. It is not merited in part or in whole by anything, anything that we do. It's not that God responds to my prayer life and, or my devotion or, my, or whatever it is, my godliness, and then says, okay, I'm going to bless your life. He blesses my life. And this is the hardest thing for us to understand. He blesses our life because of who He is, not because of who we are. He blesses our life because of who He is, not because of who we are. That is a fundamental concept within Scripture. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love in which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. The truth is, is that what sin produces in our life is death. We have this, we have this death to Christ. We are dead to God. And the last time that I looked, dead people don't, don't have relationships. They, they're just dead, right? I mean, they're just dead. So the truth is, is that when you were born into this world, you were born dead to God without the ability to respond to Him. He was the initiator and the completion of your salvation. He is the one who started it and He will be the one who finishes it. So sin makes us dead. So the only thing that I can do is receive what God gives to me. And it is so powerful when you begin to understand that concept. So let me ask you this question. How many of you saw the scandal that broke this week about celebrity parents buying their children's way into prestigious colleges? Everybody, anybody see that besides me? So how many of you were outraged by that? Come on now, let's be honest. You know, you saw that. That's just not fair, right? So I want to show you a little clip and then we're going to talk about it. So let's watch, watch this clip. This morning, under indictment and out of a job, actress Lori Loughlin dumped by the Hallmark Channel after investigators say she and her husband paid half a million dollars in bribes to get their children into USC. Why did you go to college? Mostly my parents just wanted me to go. Also dumped Loughlin's daughter, YouTube star Olivia Jade. Dropped by beauty sponsors Sephora and Tresemme after becoming the face of the scandal. Multiple media outlets reporting both of Lachlan's children now withdrawing from USC. So when I watched that, I watched that, I think it was on Good Morning America one morning. I watched that scandal unfold and I'm going, I, my righteous indignation is, you know, rising up and, you know, and I'm, I'm getting angry about this. I mean, that's not fair. And then the, the Holy Spirit says to me, time out. Wait a second here. Let's think about this for just a few minutes. Isn't that scandal your story? 
Come on now, isn't that your story? There's a scandal that's surrounding you and I. The fact is, is that you and I were be acting behaviorally, behaving badly and somebody else paid for our entrance into heaven. Come on now, isn't that true? So my friends, listen to me carefully. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a scandal. Just accept it. It's scandalous. It is not fair. It is not fair. It's not fair that you have and someone else doesn't have. It's not fair that God chose you before you chose Him. Uh, none of that is fair. None of it is fair. And yet somehow, some way, we get all twisted around and thinking there's something in me, there's something in me that certainly God is responding to. That is not the case. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He chose you before the world began, before He created anything that was created. God chose you. And as He chose you, He chose you not based upon the fact that He knew you would believe. He chose you because you were dead in your sins and trespasses. He chose you out of His own purposes. That, my friend, is scandal. You have privilege, not because of who you are, but because of what Christ has done for you. Somebody else paid the entrance fee for you to enter into the gates of heaven. And when you begin to understand that, just a corner of a door is opened up and you understanding this grace of God that is so amazing. Somebody ought to write a song about that, right? It is so amazing. So someone else's obedience and sacrifice, someone else's obedience and sacrifice caused you to be able to have a dynamic relationship to God. And there are people working hard, somehow, some way, working their way, trying to work their way to heaven, and they'll never make it, but you did. That's scandalous. And you did it not because you worked hard, but because somebody else worked hard on your behalf. Heaven is not what you know or what you have done. It is based upon who you know. If you know Jesus, you get entrance into this amazing thing called the grace of God. And that, my friend, is scandal. But why is it that we don't understand how scandalous that is? Why is it we have such a difficult time understanding this thing called the pure grace of Christ? Well, you and I live in a culture where we are, where we are culturized into believing certain things. There's certain things about our economics, there's certain things about our belief systems that cause us to have certain theologies. So let me, let me see if I can help you understand what I mean by that. So I'm going to say some, some practical statements, and you know the answers to them because you have heard them over and over again. So you finish the statement. So here we go. If it sounds too good to be true, so you knew that, right? That's what we've, we have been indoctrinated into that, right? So here we go. Let's go. Let's do another one. We make, the, we make money the old-fashioned way we There we go. There's no such thing as a free. There's no pain without, there's no gain without. And God helps those who, all of those, listen to me carefully, are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's yet, it's what we as a culture have been indoctrinated into believing. So no wonder it's so hard for us to understand what God, when, when God says that He gives us His grace, we then take that word grace and we mix it up and we, and it's part us and part God and, and somehow we think we have some fraction of the process and what I want you to understand is the faith that you have was a gift from God. Even your faith, you didn't have the faith to believe. It is all God from start to finish and none of you. And so you should go home today, when you walk out of this building, you should think, wow, I am so, I am so blown away by the fact that God did something so miraculous inside of me. So powerful. Everything about the American way of life teaches us contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing I want you to see about God's grace. Second thing I want you to see is grace is unconditional. It is unconditional. It is not based on performance. It's pure. It's a pure gift. In Ephesians, the Bible says, it is by grace that you were saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. It is a gift of God. You have been given this amazing gift from God. And it's not based upon anything else but God's love for you alone. It's God's love alone. 
And it's so, so powerful. And uh, I just want to give you one more story that I think helps drive that point home. There was a, there was a, uh, a young girl, about eight years old, who was adopted into an American family from overseas. And so the, she came in, started living with her adopted family. And uh, they, gave, they said, there's only just a couple rules here. You have to respect us. You have to respect the family. And if you could just keep your, ro- your room clean, that we would appreciate that greatly. And so the next morning they get up, the parents get up, they go into, their, into the daughter's room just to say, good morning. You know, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're part of the family. And so they walk in and the room is immaculate. Her bedroom is immaculate. And she's sitting on the edge of the bed and she looks up into their eyes and she says, I clean my room. Can I stay? Now, just think about that. I clean my room. Can I stay? In some way, in some fashion, somehow, some way, we have translated that into our walk with God. Lord, I've cleaned my life up. Can I stay? Lord, I've done all that I can do. I, Lord, can I stay? And God says, listen, I adopted you into my family based upon who I am not based upon what you do for me. And so, again, we've got to grow in this concept of the grace of God. The next concept that I want you to see about the grace of God is grace is once and forever. Grace is once and forever. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He is able. And some versions, and I love this translation, Personally, I'm an old guy, so I love this translation. Some versions say that God saves us to the uttermost. And my younger staff talked me into changing, you know, using a version that didn't use the word uttermost. And I I capitulated, but I said, but I'm going to use the word uttermost anyway. Because the word uttermost is just this dynamic word that requires us to stop and think about what does uttermost mean? What does it mean that God saved us to the uttermost? It means more than just once and forever. It means, it means far more than that. It means God went to every length to save you. It means that he spared nothing to save you. And the product of that is once and forever. So I want to tell you another story about a, an author by the name of uh, Brennan Manning. And this is an amazing story. How many of you ever read a book by Brennan Manning? Just raise your hand. He, you ought to read. He's, he's an old dead guy. You ought to read, you ought to read uh, some of his works. It's really good. He's actually a Catholic priest. And so let me tell you his story. This is found in one of his books. Uh, and actually, I heard him say this, tell this story live on stage um, when he, before he died. Uh, he, he tells the story this way. He, he had this friend that uh, he grew up with all the days of his life since they were, they were born together and they were raised together. They bought their first car together. They went on their first dates together. They graduated from high school together. They did everything together. And uh, his, friend's na- his na- friend's name was Ray. And so they joined the army together. They went through boot camp together. They were actually stationed together overseas. And one night they found themselves on the front line in a foxhole. And they were having a snack. They were eating a couple candy bars. And all of a sudden, a live grenade flies into their foxhole. Ray puts his candy bar down. Brennan Manning was just kind of frozen. He didn't know what to do. But Ray put his candy bar down, and he smiled at, smiled at his friend. He jumped on top of the grenade. It exploded. He died. He gave his life on behalf of his friend. Well, Brennan Manning comes back to the States. He eventually decides that he's going to go into the priesthood. And after, and if you know anything about the priesthood, you know that when you are selected, you change your name. You don't use your first name, your given name. And so he decided to use the word Brennan. That was his name because Ray Brennan was the guy who gave his life to save his. So Several years after this event happened, several years after he was a priest, uh, he goes to uh, Ray's house where his mother lived, Ray Brennan's mother. And so he walks in, they have, you know, they have a little fellowship together, a little time together, and, uh, and then he, something was burning on his heart that he couldn't let go of, and, he, and I, for some reason 
he asked this question to, this, to Ray's mother. He said, do you think Ray loved me? Do you think Ray loved me? And Ray's mother looked at him in the eyes and says, what more do you, uh, you think would be possible to prove that Ray loved you? And of course, the answer is nothing, right? So let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever doubted whether God loves you? Come on, just raise your hand. Let's be honest. Doubted whether God loves you. Lots of people, I hear it all the time. I don't know whether God loves me or not. Well, you know what that's like? That's like going to heaven and asking, looking at the cross, I mean, looking at the cross, having Jesus' mother standing next to the cross and asking Jesus' mother, do you think Jesus loved me? And think about that. That's ridiculous, isn't it? God proves his love for us. And while we were dead in our sins and trespasses, while we, we were yet without hope, Christ comes, we were his enemies, he makes friends with us, he reconciles us to God. There's nothing more that God can do. He loves us with his unconditional love and his grace is to the uttermost. He did everything, everything possible to prove his love for us and to redeem us. That's the measure of God's love. And I'm convinced that what I need to grow in is not more knowledge about the Bible. I think that's helpful. But I think what I really need in my life is to know more about God's grace. Because I think the more I know about God's grace, the more a lot of things unfold for my life that are just natural growth things in my life. So I just encourage you to think about that. The next thing I, that I think is true about God's grace is God's grace is unrelenting. It hunts us down. There's a very familiar section of Scripture in the 23rd Psalm. In the 23rd Psalm, I'm sure you're familiar with it, says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember that verse? Well, there's this interesting word uh, in the middle of this verse, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That sounds like such a nice word, but in the Hebrew text, that word is really a pretty interesting word. It's a manly word, actually. It's a man's man's word. And this is the, this is the idea. This is the idea that God, it's actually a hunting term. And it can be translated hunting. That, let's put that definition into it. Surely goodness and mercy shall hunt me down all the days of my life. God pursues me with a relentlessness. In fact, some versions translates translates this, God persecutes me with his loyal love to me, his love and mercy. That is so amazing. When you begin to have your eyes open to that, that God l loves me and chases me down with his unrelenting love. That is, that is how you define God's grace. It is in my weakest moment. It's on my ugly days when God hunts me down like that. Then great, great, this grace that we talk about is unfathomable. It is indescribable. It's beyond description. His words cannot describe what God has done for us in sending His one and only Son to die for us. There's no words. You cannot put words to that. Do you see how much of an insult it is to God when He has gone to every length to get you to understand His grace? It's such an insult to God when you question His love for you. Do you understand that? That is an insult. I mean, there's lots of sins you can commit. But the worst sin of all, the only unforgivable sin in the Bible as I've seen is the sin of rejecting God's grace. It's not adultery. It's not fornication. It's not homosexuality. It's none of those things that God names in Scripture as sin. It's not gossip. It's rejecting God's grace. So this thing, of, this thing called God's grace is pretty amazing. Most important concept towards man in the New Testament. The result of grace is always the same. The result of when I understand grace is my life is always transformed. I don't grow necessarily through knowledge, although I can grow a little bit through knowledge. Where I find great growth is through transformation. And where I, not, where I find transformation is in application of the grace of God in my life. So here's how it works out. So listen to this very carefully. You've got to lean into this a little bit. This is worth the price of admission. How do I know that I have this grace in my life? How do I know when I really understand the grace of God? 
when what you ought to do becomes what you want to do. That's pure and simple. Let me say it one more time to you. When what you ought to do becomes what you want to do. That's how I know that my life is being transformed by the grace of God. Let me give you a classic example. You know, the truth is, is that most of us love to collect money, right? We love holding on to it. We love to spend it a little bit, but we love holding on to it. And we love to spend it on ourselves, right? Amen. Come on now. This is church. We have to be honest with ourselves. And so we come along in the New Testament, and the New Testament teaches us thing called, this thing called grace giving. And you and I are supposed to be sacrificial in giving towards God and towards others. And, and uh, I, I know my first, when I, when, when I first was introduced as a young believer to this concept, I'm thinking, okay, well, what's my minimum buy in here, God? What's the least amount that I can do and still feel pretty good about myself? And so where I am today is that, I, you know, honestly, I wish I had more to give. I would if I had more to give. I would give more. I have learned the, the concept because what I ought to do has become what I want to do. It's a grace issue. Giving isn't a greed issue. It's a grace issue. And when you are greedy, it's because you don't understand, listen to this carefully, the grace of Jesus. You're still living out a different economy. You're living out of a wrong platform. And when you step into the platform of God's grace, it changes everything and it makes what you, it makes what you ought to do become what you want to do. I remember you know, 40-some years ago when I first came to Christ, I was a young man, 23 years old. My wife and I came to Christ together, and uh, we believed on Jesus together, and this is how it happened. We were invited to a church. I didn't want to go. I'm just telling you, I didn't want to go. I told the woman we'd come one time, this lady that, l that invited us, I said, we'll come one time, and after that, leave us stinking alone. I don't want to go to church. So I went to church that day out of compulsion, and so we went to that church, and that day, uh, the Spirit of God got a hold of us. And that afternoon, my wife and I together got down on our knees, and we confessed our need of faith in, in Christ, and we trusted in Him. And, and uh, it was just this miraculous conversion. And, and uh, I got up off my knees that day knowing something, there was a transaction that had been made in heaven, and I knew it. I knew it without any doubt. And so we got, we went, this is in the, in the old days when you had to use yellow pages, I don't know if you know what that is, but Yellow Pages is a phone, I shouldn't buy, I'm just talking language that most of you don't understand. You don't even know what a phone book is, do you? So anyway, it came with your phone and you had to look up numbers. And so we got in the Yellow Pages and we discovered that this church had a Sunday night church service. And so we'd been there Sunday morning, we'd been there Sunday morning and, and, uh, and we didn't know they had a Sunday night service, so we looked, at, we looked them up in the, in the phone book, they had a Sunday night service, so we decided to go and I'll never forget the response I got on the front step of this pastor, I walked up, my wife and I walked up together, and uh, he looked us in the eyes and he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> because nobody he had ever led to Christ ever came back to Sunday night services. Because what had happened in my life is God's grace had so transformed me that what I ought to do became what I wanted to do. And it no longer became a drudgery. It no longer became something that I hated or I'm just checking off my list so that I can feel better about my relationship to God. The thing is, is that what I ought to do became so natural and it became something I love to do. One of the things that people hate to do is they hate to share their faith with others. And I, I'm going, I don't understand that because, I mean, I, I could understand it if, you know, before I discovered the grace of God. That's a grace issue. Because once grace comes into your life, my friend, when you find a great restaurant, you want to tell all your friends, right? Hey, have you checked this out? Have you checked this sports bar out? Have you, you know, gosh, this is awesome, right? So when grace happens in my life, it's because what happens is what I, what I ought to do becomes what I want to do. And that is how I know whether I have received the grace of God. Now, what should be my response? If, I, if this is all true, what should be my response to that? And I'm gonna say, I'm, I could say lots of things, but I'm going to just say three things because I'm almost out of time, so I want to give you three real quick things. First thing is, is that once grace of, the grace of God has happened in my life, then the natural response is a desire to worship God. Unfiltered, unreserved, 
worship of God is the natural response of the grace of God. It's just natural that I would want to praise the one who redeemed me, that one who bought me, the one who entered my life when I didn't deserve it. I would want to praise him for that. It would become a natural response. Grace produces a hunger to, to do that. And uh, it's, it's like this. This is how I, I liken it. You know these sunglasses that are polarized? And you put those polarized sunglasses on, you begin to see the world differently, right? I mean, you see colors that you never saw before. You see things in a different way. That's the way it is when you put on the lenses of God's grace. You no longer see anything the same. It's all different. It's all different. It's all different. It's a game changer when you put on the lens of God's grace and you begin to look at people and God and circumstances and suffering and all of those things that we so sometimes hate, when you put on the lens of God's grace, it becomes something that draws you to worship. Praise God and understand. The second thing I think that grace, the grace of God does when I really understand it is it produces growth in my life. It's, it produces growth. Grace produces a hunger to know God more and to surrender to Him unconditionally. Titus says that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. The grace of God creates a hunger for me. See, if I don't have a hunger for God, the issue is that I don't understand the grace of God yet. If I struggle to read the Bible, it's because it's a grace issue. It's a grace issue. It's just a grace issue. I think the last thing that I would say to you today is that if, if you understand the grace of God, I think the third natural thing that would happen is that this, you would have this pursuit. You would stop fighting His will and begin to take delight in what he, His ways are. And, uh, and I think you just, you just pursue God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So with that said, how important is grace? It is, listen to me carefully, it is the single, it is the single most important concept in the Bible. And you cannot understand anything else in the Bible without putting on the lens of grace. When you put on the lens of grace, you see everything in a new light. Until then, when you read the Bible, it's just, it is just a, it's just words. It's just duty. But when you put on the lens of grace and you see grace on every page and you see the work of God's grace in every person that's in, in recorded in Scripture, when you see all that, it changes the game. It's a game changer, friends. It's a game changer, this thing called the grace of God. So I want to end our time together really, really quickly with just a couple questions for you. Do you behave like what you believe about grace? When people see your life, does your behavior reflect, does it reflect your belief in God's grace? Let's talk about you personally. What do you need to receive God's grace in? What do you need to receive God's grace in? Some of you might be struggling with the idea of, I think I've committed a sin that God couldn't forgive. Are you kidding me? See that cross? That's just a symbol there, but that cross represents the fact that God saves us to the uttermost. There's no sin that you could ever commit that God couldn't forgive you. Maybe some of you have esteem issues. When you look in the mirror, you think, Oh, I can't stand myself. That's not an esteem issue. That's a grace issue. You're looking, at the, you're looking in the mirror with all the wrong lens, not the grace of God's lens. So powerful. So let's talk about how you deal with others. Who do you need to offer grace to? Who are you treating badly? Who do you need to forgive? Those aren't forgiveness issues. It's not bad behavior issues, it's grace issues. You treat people badly because you don't understand the work of grace in your own life. That's how it works. Once you understand the grace of God, it so humbles you, it so humbles you that there's nothing else to do but to love people and love God. But you can't just do that on your own. It happens only when you have a grace encounter. And so I 
I just wanted to encourage you right now to bow your heads, close your eyes, and no one looking around. Just right now, give you an opportunity to respond to what I just said. So if you want to respond, here's what, I would, here's what I would do. I'd say, dear God, I've recognized that I don't know hardly anything about your grace. Today, I want to begin a journey of every day experiencing and understanding and encountering your grace. And God, I pray that you transform, transform my life in every way how I see myself and how I see my enemies, how I see my friends, how I see my wife, my husband, my children. May I see them through your eyes of grace. In Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name, amen. I hope you meant business just now as you encountered God. I want to end with this thought. Here should be our prayer. Here would be our prayer. If we understand grace, this is what I would pray. God, Show me today what I don't know about your grace. Show me today what I don't... I think we should begin every day with that. Lord, show me today what I don't know about your grace because I want to tell you this. You and I, if we put all of our understanding together about God's grace, if we put it all together, we could fill a thimbleful of God's grace. It's immeasurable, and it's God's change agent. May God bless you as you live in His grace.